Thank you, Mark, for this uh, for this conversation. I feel very privileged to be able to talk to you because I think the two main topics I want to talk about today are two of your really strong suits and actually two of the places that I imagine you have more experience than most people on this planet with, yeah. which, uh, which is I would love to talk about your ABC centering with you. Sure. Um, to get a tiny bit of background on how did you come up with that, but also what, what's your understanding of the strong suits and also the limitations of ABC centering. Yeah. And I would love to talk about um, using centering and embodiment as a possibility to integrate um, deeper experiences we've had. Because I come from the field of therapy, peace slash spirituality sure. and i see a lot of people having very deep experiences yes. that lead nowhere yeah. and my sense is that embodiment is oftentimes one of the key missing links yes. and i would love to talk about how to consciously integrate embodiment and or centering as a way to actually get these experiences into ourselves into our bones Okay, great. I mean, it's, I had a rare moment of humility there when you said, um, you know, more about this than almost anyone on the planet. And then you clarified the subjects and I went, no, he's right. So, um, this, <laughs> so, so no humility needed. Humility needed at all for this. No fake humility. So <laughs> love, let's dive in. Where do you want me to start? So I would love to start with the ABC centering first. Mm. Um, and just for those who have never heard this term, ABC centering is, I think, a, a method you developed yeah should i define centering yeah that's probably go for it okay so yeah abc is a method of centering um the term centering is a bit of a bucket category like grounding or releasing even um what it generally refers to is the reduction of the fight flight response okay through physical methods primarily that tend to be quick um, and the methods that you can do while on the move. So for example, pouring a cup of tea or driving a car or in a business meeting, you don't have to go and meditate for an hour or go do a yoga class. Um, so and some people extend it to any kind of state regulation. So we could be looking at centering to reduce the grasping response, which is the other side of fight or flight that most Western therapists don't know about, but most Buddhists do. Um, the other thing can be used for is any kind of reg any kind of regulation, which instead of we can think of that as up or down regulation. So down, sympathetic, uh, up, sympathetic. Some people use centering just for down. Some people use it for up. Some people use it for sideways, meaning any kind of state shift. Some people use it very specifically to mean techniques that involve orientating to the center of mass of the body. Um, often these come from martial arts like Aikido, which I've studied in depth. Um, I've geeked out over many, many years, tried these techniques with many, many people, therapists, coaches, yoga teachers in war zones, politicians, police, military, everyone, and got quite good at figuring out what really works. Um, mm -hmm. BC is a technique that I've put together, which is sort of one of the um, more effective kinds of centering and there's reasons for that though there's many others uh, Paul Linden's another master of centering and he has some that are as quick as relax your belly you know could be let the tongue hang loose in the mouth that's a three second instruction you know and that for most people will reduce their level of stress or that kind of um, adrenal kind of response why would we do that well because it makes us stupid mean and dumb and not creative so when people are in that response you know there's neurological reasons for this they're not very clever they're not very kind and they're not very creative and that's a problem for a lot of people so centering reduces the unhelpful effects of fight or flight uh, and isn't equivalent to just not feeling sometimes therapists have a worry about that uh, it should actually make you more connected to yourself subjectively uh, happier subjectively objectively less in that uh, fight or flight reaction which is a physical thing um, and intersubjectively, it should improve the relationship and the connection. So for obviously for people like therapists, that's pretty important. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of uses and there's many methods. I could geek out about it all day. I wrote a whole book about it. So um, there's a chapter in my book for trainers and coaches and a whole ebook about this. And I, I think that's still the most in-depth thing out there. It's a bit of a download, but I hope that kind of sets us up for a bit more yeah. of a chat. No, I, I appreciate that. And not just not only do you have those ebooks, you also have lots of YouTube videos that go into the different elements of centering that I found uh, personally very useful also as quick reference videos of 
five minutes of all the possibilities for centering. Boom, 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 boom. So uh, I, I appreciate that about you. Five minutes. Yeah, we keep those short. So sometimes they're guided, like three minute ABC. We can do that if you want. Uh, other times they're more like the theory of it behind it. So, um, yeah. you know, for useful. And I, I think for people listening, it's like the coaches I teach say it's one of the most helpful things for coaching is that I still coach people myself as well as train coaches and pretty much everyone turns up to coaching stressed or busy. You know, I've turned up this interview pretty much like that. Right. You know, I can do a centering now just for myself, but it's um, that's just normal life for most people these days, particularly like successful executives and people in business, you know, so, but most people, so helping them regulate a little bit just means they're going to get a lot more out of the session at the beginning of the session. And then you could do it again at the end before to resource someone before they go back into the world. And I was actually, as someone who's trained in this as a martial artist, I was quite shocked when I started doing therapy that the therapist didn't know any of this stuff. I was like, well, this is such an obvious quick win. Why would you not learn this? And you, you don't have to be like keto master to tell someone to put their feet on the floor or relax their belly, right? This is pretty obvious. I, I, do, I do think also the way you teach centering does have a very clear martial arts, get yourself together, meet what's there from the best state you can feel to it so uh, my sense is that that's quite deeply in the way you you're embracing the centering as a possibility in life yeah i think there's a couple of things there one is martial arts tend to be quite pragmatic the other thing is martial arts mm -hmm. are quick like modern life so you don't really have time to you know therapists will regulate you through co-regulation like a you know a nice therapist talk to, i talk to my therapist for 50 minutes i feel better afterwards just you know because they're paying attention and being empathic and all that rogerian stuff right there's nothing wrong with that rogerian stuff we, we call that we call that social centering and on zoom we get people to look at each other we get people maybe to synchronize breath together we get people to connect lean forwards in their chairs different things so the social center is great and therapists tend to be good at that implicitly, but they take a long time about it. And martial artists tend to be good at the physical stuff rather than the social stuff, which they're crap at usually because you don't, you don't co-regulate with someone trying to punch you. Right. Like that's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, what they tend to be good at is just the physical regulation. And there's a third level, which is something like meaning based. So we can also, we can orientate to our commitments um, Strozzi does this a lot. He's another one of the centering sort of masters out there in the coaching world. And um, that's the sort of third way to center. So we have the physical level, put your feet on the ground, relax your belly, peripheral vision. I mean, I could name 50 things just in the body. Like right now, your mouth's a little bit tight, for example, right? Like if you relaxed your jaw slightly, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd be more relaxed. My belly is a bit tight today. Um, my posture's not great. Like one of my feet's off the floor just because of the nature of my desk. You know, also my spinal position, like, you know, if I was sitting like this, would my, that's going to be very different than if I relax into my chair and mm -hmm. the meditators. And they're like, okay, we all, you know, we do Zen, we have to sit up straight. And I'm like, well, not if you have anxiety, not if you're angry. That's a terrible idea. Meditate in an armchair, meditate lying on the floor. You know, sometimes we can do things like lie on the floor. Sometimes we just have to do that more subtly. And this is where the skill comes in. You know, I can change my vision to being more peripheral while we're talking and you won't even notice I'm doing it and there just might be some sense of like oh Mark got nicer or softer or something like that or you know if I do if I stare at you right that feels different to you but it's like you might not you know consciously have realized what's happened so I mean we can always affect things like our eyes and our spine and our pelvic floor and you know breathing with a slightly different part of the body like I'm actually fairly um, awake and caffeinated this morning, but were I, were I to sort of be a bit tired, I would just start subtly breathing more into my upper chest. I'm exaggerating, but I could do that without you noticing, right? I just start breathing slightly more into the chest and the belly. And, and that's what I would do if I was with a client and I was feeling bored and tired and I wanted to energize myself. Um, so that all of centering is, you know, a top down approach to changing your physiology because you're, perception cognition emotion relationship is all based on that physiology and it's also the most direct thing we can change right okay. so changing the mind is pretty hard <laughs> changing someone's spirit i don't even know how to start that but changing someone's uh, body that's easy right like that's and i think if i'm good at something it's giving very clear language for that as well and that comes from paul my teacher so credit where credit's due <laughs> and i mean so I, I really like what you said there and i want to unpack that for a moment because i think it's a it's easy to miss because what I heard you say, it's, it's about the choice. 
I can top down choose to do certain things that have a possible a positive impact or a hopefully positive impact on my state. I don't know if they will, but these are the things that often work. They are. Um, Definitely will. Yeah, and positive as defined by the situation, not as defined by there's a right or wrong way. So there's sometimes mm -hmm. I relax and sometimes I want to wake up, right? Depending on, you know, the end of the day, I want to relax. I don't want to wake up in the morning. I might want to wake up. So obviously that depends on the situation you're in that you have. We talk about awareness and choice. So the first piece here is the therapist or coach or whoever needs to have enough body awareness that they notice that they're all fucked up. And then then they can unfuck themselves, right? Like, like when one of my teachers said that to me years ago, is it okay to swear actually, Lucas? I, if not, I yeah, please feel free to talk the way you talk. And this is how I was raised, I was Irish family. So like my teacher, <laughs> Walsh, you're all fucked up. Go on, fuck yourself. And it's like, I hadn't noticed I was fucked up because I didn't have enough awareness of my emotional and physical state at that point, right? But I did know some techniques of centering to unfuck myself. Otherwise you just, telling someone to change their, their mood or their mind or their emotions is just impossible. You can't do it. It's like a little kid, just tell a two-year-old not to be angry. They don't know how to do it. They have to learn, you know, and everybody's learned some techniques, but most of the, most of us stopped learning about three or four years old. And what we have is pretty limited. Obviously martial artists take it to the next level because we're under intense pressure and stress. Right. Um, and anyone who is. Which can also have its massive side effects of kind of, getting rigid in the putting myself together exactly so rigidity is one of the potential dark sides of centering so centering is generally a massively good thing it's one of the quick wins i teach leaders coaches whatever uh however if someone does too much centering they get too top down they get like a kind of centering robot you see this with martial artists they get very controlling of themselves yogis too do this a lot and that's where we need the other side which is we could call the process work so there's a sort of yin and yang here. So the process work is the bottom up work where we let the body do what it wants to do. Like right now, I just want to go, blah, blah. I don't know why I just do, right? That's really easy for me to do that as opposed to like, what would be difficult for me right now? Um, like that sound is hard for me to make right now. Like blah, is easy, yeah? Mm -hmm. But there's the process that wants to happen in the body and the idea there is very different. We're not reducing a fight flight response. We're enabling or the body as a verb, the body as process, enabling and getting out of the way of that so it can complete what it needs to. So that's a whole different model. Um, mm -hmm. Rhythms dance would be that, you know, improv comedy involves another like that. And that's a different skill set. Um, and both are necessary for health. Yeah. And I, I mean, I would say for me, when I, when I was reading your, your book for instance and listening to your videos my sense is that you in the centering elements often aside with choice what's the choices you have top down what are the things you can do and I, I really like you putting it into this context of we've learned to self-regulate to some degree mm -hmm. but there might be potential there to learn to self-regulate even more yeah. um uh and also it's kind of unconscious for a lot of people. So the journey, think of a, a baby, right? Great, lots of expression. A two-year-old, really expressive, okay? So if, if expression is your ultimate goal, be a two-year-old, um, but it's unconscious expression. And then we learn unconscious uh, regulation. So society says, don't have that emotion. Our family says, don't do like that. Don't express yourself that way, sexually, whatever it is. Uh, and then we're sort of unconsciously controlled or repressed as it were, right? Um, what the journey is here is from is conscious expression and conscious self-regulation and also just more effectively, just at a higher level. Like the, honestly, I, I look at most adults and they look like toddlers to me. I go, you cannot express yourself and you cannot get your shit together. And it's kind of pathetic to me, if I'm honest, if people are in the business of that, like there's sort of no excuse for it if you're in our business. So, I mean, I know it sounds kind of harsh and demanding, Well, it's like, no, the skills are there, go learn them. They're not that hard. So, so that would be, again, the choice side. The other side that you've called expression, I would have potentially called surrender. Surrendering to what's there in the body, following it, and through that, having that process work, however you want to call it, to have also new experiences that potentially go beyond what I can even imagine with the centering possibilities I have until now. Yeah, listen, they both start with listen. Uh, listen, surrender, encourage. 
would be the skill sets. So I tend to break things down into skill sets, very concrete. So for example, like, you know, before I made that noise before I had to kind of like tune into myself, right? And then I uh, got to get out my way, surrendered to the fact that's how I was. And then there was, you know, then I was able to actually encourage it to move it, give it a little, the bird that gives the little baby bird a nudge out of the nest, you know? So um, I'd say they're the skill sets there. So, um... One more question before I want to move on with the topic, but you you mentioned the fight flight a lot. You don't mention the freeze as much in the fight flight. Um, does that have a reason? Is that because you mostly work with people who do shitloads, so they're usually more in the fight flight than in a freeze? Or what, what's your emphasis there? But just to bring everyone up to speed, so fight flight happens in a sequence, right? This is Stephen Porges type stuff. So we have um, orientating freeze. So if I make a loud noise, it's orientating freeze which is not really a freeze, it's just an orientating pause. Um, and then generally it's uh, fight if you can't, flight, sorry, if you can't run away, then fight, yeah? So within, there's a particular neurology to that, which can be controlled quite a lot with uh, centering. Uh, a proper freeze response uh, or dissociation response, uh, that, I mean, centering can help with that. For example, like getting people to stamp their feet on the ground or push their legs into the floor can stop people dissociating. And there's some great tools from somatic therapy around that, particularly trauma therapy. And freeze, like a proper freeze response, centering's not the answer. So at that point, you, you need to go into things like the trauma releasing techniques and things, right? But what most people call freeze is just the tension that comes with fight, like a true freeze response, like that, that's, you're like way in the red at that point. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. At that point, you're not, you're not functional. So sent you like the idea of sort of consciously doing centering is it's a bit late. You, you, you've, you've gone, you know, you've, but because this is sequential, you can catch it early. And the earlier you, the better you can spot it. Like when your anus is just starting to contract or your eyes, you know, this subtle canaries the body has. Do you know what I mean by canaries? Like early warning signs. If you can catch it then, centering is really easy, right? You just relax your anus or whatever it is, yeah? Relax your jaw or your eyes. But if, if you're already down that path from anger to rage to a fully catatonic freeze, I mean, at that point, you need something else. Yeah, I mean, when you're truly in the freeze, freeze in the sense of uh, catatonic or fully dissociated, uh, just doing a bit of centering is not that easy. I personally would say my model of the polyvagal is much more that we have different parts of us in freeze, in fight, in whatever. And I personally find that with parts of me that are a bit more checked out or any of that, that I would map onto the freeze elements, I personally find that, uh, that centering can work if the part is not too big, if it's not like I am completely in that. That's just been my personal experience with that. Talking to Richard Schwartz in a couple of hours. So I'm, I'm just starting Interesting. to explore the whole parts thing. Yeah, I mean, I've done some big mind work before, which is related, but um, parts thing's probably out of my expertise, but certainly uh, in, is a place I'm curious and interested in right now. So that, that's where we would be in my expertise parts, parts talk. Um, but today it's all about your expertise because I really want to learn from you. So fight flight regulating learning to do that better kind of top down as that's what centering is about for mm -hmm. me i'm for me i'm really curious about the connection between what you've called the process work and the centering mm -hmm. and because for me i am very fascinated by the potential of process work in, in the sense of uh, listen surrender and courage as you've called it and the new somatic, but also being states we can discover through that. And then how to reconnect that with our daily embodied experience. Okay. And I'm, I'm curious what your experience is with that connection. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I'm clear yet, but let's just go into it a little bit. So an important thing to say as well is that process work is often regulate, regulating. And often if you're getting diminishing turns, returns from one switch to the other, so you see people that are a little bit over controlled and they're very good at keeping it all in, but you could just tell they're going to walk through the office with an AK-47 anytime soon, you know? So it's like, you know, too much control leads to these explosions, right? And the process naturally comes out in this very extreme way. Um, so also the control gets harder and harder if you need to do process work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But similarly, people that do just process work, sometimes they're kind of a mess and their life's kind of a mess and they dance five rhythms and they cry every day and, and you know, they grow their hair long like yours, Lucas. And, you know, they, they should go to martial arts and just, you know, learn to get their shit together. So it's, it's you, when, when someone has like diminishing returns from one is usually the time to switch, but process work is absolutely regulating um there's in the, and when people talk about the wisdom or the body or that kind of thing you know that's what that's what's meant i believe that's what's meant yeah i mean it's being able to use the body to heal or connect with deeper elements of us that need healing the, i think the the point i'm really trying to look mm -hmm. to and is this in in my experience doing process work usually when it's done well and when we have a deepening opening regulating leads to somatic states of sometimes profound openness profound regulation that are very often new to the people right 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 so let's this is this is interesting i'm not super expert here but let's explore it yes. i mean one thing that happens is people just get into altered states when they dance for example i was just talking to mm -hmm. my Adam Barley about this and he was lamenting how little that gets integrated he was saying you need to chat about it afterwards and we're quite good on the integration so I'm sure we'll come back to that um I think another thing that happens is sort of energy and just using this as a metaphor um that was sort of being used to hold part of you apart or part of you together is now freed up yeah and it, if you look at this in terms of states that's one way another way would be developmentally so if we took sort of will Wilbur's kind of models or spiral dynamics or something. If you imagine that 20 on a good day, 25% of me is at level seven, say, on a just to use a number model, right? Just to give it arbit fairly arbitrary. 50% of the time is level six, but when I'm in fight or flight, it's level five or even four. Yeah, the, the integral people don't take nearly enough attention to states because it's like you, you're super like advanced meditator, a high level state guy, but but most of the time you're hungry and in a bad mood, you're not going to act from there. Yeah. I also I also think they often miss the distinction between conceptual understanding and embodied reality. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm always I always ask people, can't you know, if someone says they're integral, I'll actually ask for tests that their life shows that. So they're like, if you've integrated level five, you should be making good money. You know, if you've integrated your level four, you should be able to sing the national anthem without cringing, which you know for Germans is always fun. Um, you know, so it's it's like like I'm looking for evidence of integration in their actual lives, not so much that they can conceptually get it. Um, though any one thing like that is, you know, this is, I'm half joking. Um, so in terms of how it interfects levels, I think there's a sense of like when we do the process work, we're able to more of the time operate from a higher capacity. And for some people, that's pretty new, and they're like, whoa, what is this? And it, it's pretty spacey or hard to, you know, I remember the first time I sat next to a Zen master, it was like, I just taken acid. It was like, whoa, and he was just state transmitting and I was just tripping out from being next to him. And no, we weren't doing any technique, even, you know? So, you know, that was, that was the first time I'd just been, been within a few meters of someone that had that kind of state as a stabilized thing. So he was just <laughs> giving it to me, you know? Yeah, yeah I think that I, I... I actually like exploring this. This is one of my favorite things to do is exploring on the edge of our understanding. That's much more fun to me than having clear concepts. Um, but because what, what, what I, I would even get a tiny bit more specific because, so let's say I've danced five rhythms. I've had a profound experience and I'm actually much more interested in the state inside the body after that. Uh -huh. So not the expression itself, but having expressed, having had that energetic release or download or however it feels and you call it um how is your body after that how is your being after that yeah. and can we consciously then use centering to reconnect with that quality in us yeah yeah okay so let's differentiate physiology from embodiment first of all because you will if you dance for two hours just have a physiological shift. oh yeah in the same way as I give you a shot of whiskey, you're going to have a physiological shift, right? But it doesn't mean you're going to be permanently drunk. It just means that you have some whiskey in you until it wears off. So dance Which for me would not be good. I would be absolutely, um, I, I react basically allergically to alcohol. So you wouldn't want to see that. <laughs> Everyone's allergic to it to greater or lesser degrees. That's what being drunk is. Anyway, but um, so 
let's differentiate between just physiological change, which will happen with dancing in quite profound ways. Like I went to the gym yesterday, I lifted weights for two hours. I was high by the end of it. You're full of smack. You're full of heroin. You're full of endorphins. You know, like that's my nap. I was in the sauna with this girl who'd been lifting heavy weights with me and we were just chilling in the sauna and we were both high. You know, we we're just in that nice endorphin buzz, you know. Um, and then that's a little bit different from necessarily embodied shift or some profound, you know, psychological, allergenic kind of thing. I used to notice that whenever I did for rhythms, and I haven't done it for a while because of lockdown, that I'd be really relaxed and really creative for a few hours afterwards and have all my best ideas, you know? So it was like something had got freed up for creativity. Um, physiologically, let me make it real simple. It's pretty much just relaxation. Like your personality, your neurosis is mostly just like indigestion. It's a tension pattern. And the relaxed expansive relaxation i should say because some people when i say relaxation they think collapse but relaxed expansive relaxation that's what love is <laughs> that's, that's all it is yeah physiologically so embodiment wise sorry not physiologically obviously physiologically there's hormones and neurotransmitters and other things so um generally what you're going to see with upper states is more relaxed expansion and this is why you can kind of hear it when you hear a meditation master in his voice because normally they have quite a deep, relaxed voice. The, the voice is deep because the belly is soft and it resonates deep into their belly. And some people affect this and they do a sort of fake Californian version, you know. But actually you can you can feel the difference, but like normally when I talk to a meditation, I'm like, okay, this guy's got it. This guy's somewhere, you know, somewhere I've been, but haven't stabilized. And um, mostly that's just relaxation you're hearing. Yeah. And so I, I would agree with that. So I, I really like the distinction physiologically, somatically, and that they are very connected, but not the same. Um, and to me, it's, it's oftentimes, I also have it at with set after sessions with people that they, their posture will have changed, but not in a dramatic way, just in a, that place that always holds doesn't hold right now. And that just means that the whole posture is, intrinsically different and i actually find that that's one thing that we can then consciously cultivate to yeah. actually yeah. connect with that one spot and can you relax that again yeah i mean there's sort of somatic marker type things in that often a, a shift will have a somatic equivalence right actually it always mm -hmm. say uh, and if identify that then you can there's a bi-directional link right it works both ways so you can, i guess you can use that as your entrance point or gateway back into a state if there's one particular piece you know it's like hey my feet sink more into the floor hey my jaw softens whatever it is so i think that can be useful for people then they've got like a key to getting in, get in the future um the other guy who'd be worth speaking to if you love state stuff would be dylan newcomb he has a system called izazu which has... Um, hey, that's a classic name right there. Great. Ooh, um, he can tell you about the name. I hate the name, but I love the system. I love the guy. So he's really the state master when it comes to embodiment. And it's he's not just talking fight or flight. He's really making it very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of that, because that for me would be part of integration. And you just about 10 minutes ago said you you actually work a lot with integration yeah. what's what is it that you found helps people with integrating experiences new insights what do you find the key for that okay how do states become traits is kind of the question right mm -hmm. or how do we move learning from one specific context to other contexts within our life would be the other way of putting it yeah so first of all let's get been really accurate because that really helps um so there's different ways to do it what is do the state a lot Okay, so that's the Buddhist monk way to do it. You do it four hours a day, okay? Then you just then it just naturally integrates. For those of us who don't have time to do that, there are other methods. Um, so I've been obsessed with this in yoga and meditation. You know, yoga is great for state changing, but it doesn't integrate much in most people's lives, yeah? Now, the, the challenge slash problem slash solution is how this is concept of the container. So whenever we're doing a practice, we need a container. So that's a metaphor. What it means is we have limitations and simplifications and lack of consequences. So if you think of a meditation uh, retreat, you don't talk, you don't fuck, you don't do business deals, you don't do email, okay? 
um, and it's very simplified and you can't really get it wrong. It's not like you're going to crash your car and die if you get it wrong. OK, I mean, you can do it more or less effectively, but there's not really any consequences there. So, so we've got the same in a yoga class. It's a simplified container. Yeah. Now, that's wonderful because it enables us to access special or deeper states that we can't in our normal life. Uh -huh. OK, so most people have the experience of doing yoga at home. It's a little bit less deep than going to a yoga class. Also being surrounded by other people doing it. The social container is really helpful here. Uh, it might be a cultural container, you know, the arm on, on the wall and the nice environment physically. Uh -huh. Uh, the special yoga pants that you put on or the Aikido uniform that you put on. You know, it was interesting. I once went to Aikido and I'd forgotten my uniform. It's after like 10 years of doing Aikido. It's the first time it happened. And I, I couldn't do Aikido. I was rubbish. I was like back to white belt level. You know, I could barely do a basic technique, even though I was pretty good at Aikido after 10 years, right? Um, because the context had changed. The container had been changed, right? Um, which obviously is a problem for self-defense, which is the exact same problem, actually. So the, the thing that leads to the most effective change is our biggest problem for transfer into our life. Okay. So, so the thing that leads to the most profound in the moment exactly. state change. Exactly. That, thanks for the, the, the add addition there. Is that, that like, if you want to get really deep into meditation, go off on your own in the woods on a solitary retreat. But if you don't live on your own or in the woods, that's a very different environment. And this is where people have the experience of going to yoga class or going to meditation retreat or Aikido or whatever, and they feel really good. And then they come out of it and very quickly they lose it. Right. So with embodied yoga, particularly as a system I developed, we got really geeky about this and people can look up my embodied yoga stuff for more on this. And we're starting to do it with meditation, but yoga was the first place we looked at it because I was just so profoundly unhappy when I'd see someone in Shavasana, super blissed out and relaxed. And then within two minutes, they pick their phone up and have lost everything. It's like you just wasted an hour and a half of your life. Yeah. I'd see people come out of class and by the time they'd walk down the stairs of the Buddhist Brighton Buddhist Center, they'd have lost it. And I was just like, what? other than a holiday, what was the point? I mean, that's the other thing. The thing that leads to the best yoga holiday, literally and figuratively, is the thing that makes it less likely to integrate. Like you if you want integration, you should be doing yoga with your phone in your hand right? Because you have your phone in your hand, God knows how many hours a day. If you want an integration, you should be doing yoga in a sexual context, in a verbal context, like circling, meditate while talking. Talking is fucking different to not talking. Yeah, technology. Uh, in your house, this is one thing Zoom's been great for, is helping people do their practice. In their life. I, I, I do a class in my office, and then I go back to my email. Yeah, why aren't you doing your meta practice with Facebook? You do meta, you're imagining wishing people love it. Why imagine them? Pull them up on the screen. It's easy. Type their name in. Lucas. Meta, meta, meta. Easy. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is what I call integrative practices. The other one is what Shin Zen Young calls micro hits, and I call pit stops. So pit stops is we have people five times a day set an alarm. When it goes off, they do one minute of body-based mindfulness or one minute of whatever they're practicing. Okay. So we have integrative practices, which bring back in things that aren't in the container yeah and you can think of this as like a ladder so on our on our coaches course we start people off with uh sitting meditation then walking meditation that's the beginning of a ladder then we have them do mindful walks but without talking then mindful interaction then you get to the ultimate not because it's the best because it's the most complex would be like improv actually in this order the least complex from meditation to yoga to conscious dance to martial arts, because you're still not talking, though it is combat, so it's stress, which is another level, right? Um, uh, tantra, sort of sexy tantra, you know, that's pr it's pretty distracting to try and meditate with three hot Russian girls writhing on you, just a little fantasy, put that out to the universe. Uh, and maybe even the most advanced, okay, um, improv comedy, right? Like that was improv comedy I just did, by the way. Um, so improv comedy would be like your social and verbal and it's fast and you've got to be funny like that's hard so how much of your meditation is going to transfer not very much yeah so i like to put students on this ladder and they practice every step because down here you get the sensitivity and the depth and the specificity and up this end you get the more it's more like life so through having a ladder of practice and integrative and you know at different times in your life you might focus in different areas it's hard to have like eight different practices right you know i have meditation, uh, yoga, conscious dance, martial arts, and then 
uh, embodied leadership, which would be another one of the more advanced ones, right? Because we're talking, we're doing something. Um, so there's other things I recommend, uh, but they're that loosen the container. But this this idea of understanding the container and how it's a positive and negative is the key um, principle to understand. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I like I like the perspective of the container and actually, I mean, it comes down to the state specific knowledge, all all of that stuff. But it's actually making the steps smaller rather than going two weeks in a in a forest business meeting there are a few small steps between that you can't transfer the state transfers too different so you make the steps you do it consciously you have a plan for that by the way the people who understand this best in the world are myself and shinzen young shinzen young and i independently came up with all the same concepts pretty much and he's he's just got different names for them uh he's more of a meditation guy than i am um and I think is excellent at this stuff. And obviously some of those contexts are pretty new from 2,500 years ago, like the computer. You know, the Buddha already did the four postures, sitting, lying down, uh, standing and walking, which pretty much covered it back in the day. I would say social context, but monks didn't really have to worry about that because they're around other monks. So they didn't really need uh, interpersonal meditation. There's no formal interpersonal meditation in Buddhism like circling. Yeah, so I think that's a nice addition to the sort of repertoire. And then the tech additions would be the other one. And there's the slightly more sort of verbal social ones, because, again, the Buddhist monks didn't have to be leaders or be funny or be lovers. They didn't have any of that shit. They'd taken that all out. They weren't business leaders. They weren't husbands. They weren't mindful parents. That would be another advanced practice. And also the difference between practice and application. So most people confuse these two. Application is where there are consequences and you can't control the variables. So you can't tell your wife to be 20% less annoying or your kids to be 20% more loving. You can't do it, okay? And also if you fuck up your parenting or your, or your marriage, it's not really fair, right? There's a consequence and it's not fair on the others. Whereas uh, in meditation, you can you know, increase or decrease the length of practice, change the technique. And it, you know, if, you, if your mind drifts for an hour when you're meditating, it doesn't end your marriage, right? No. So um, most, some people will say things like, oh, my practice is, um, parenting or whatever and i'm like no it's not it's not and it shouldn't be and you shouldn't be attempting to make it because that's unfair on you them and, it, and it's a bad practice yeah so i just you can name this differently but i call one practice one application uh, you could do a light practice which is where you have a daily life activity which is non-consequential and easy so for example i could walk to the shops mindfully now that's not the same as walking in a monastery because there's still traffic to be aware of, right? So I can't, you know, it's not totally easy. It's this stubborn, but that's a nice bridging. I'd call that a light practice, which is a nice bridge. For example, this conversation is an application. Imagine we'd had this conversation 50 times and you were really boring. This would be, I could use this as a light practice. Imagine I was boring. It's not that hard to imagine. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> my edge which is means it's like you can't practice on your edge you know, something else it's a different thing so yeah the other thing the state people make is they get reliant on a crutch so that could either be a very firm container uh, or it could be something which insists upon a state so uh, this is why kink is great for mindfulness but it's not real mindfulness because you pay attention but only because you're being whipped right like that's easy so you're not getting a transferable skill because unless you're going to walk around whipping yourself, you've become reliant upon the stimulus. Or people will say skiing's my mindfulness. Well, that's useless for the rest of your life. Does it make sense? Actually, you'll probably, if anything, you'll be numb. I used to work around a lot of extreme snowboarders. I used to do a lot of ski resorts. And people can be checked out in their life because they've become reliant upon hurtling down a cliff at 50 miles an hour. It's, it's a crazy uh, hormone rush. Like skiing is agree it's addictive i'm an addict you know? I, I, i've been addicted to everything in and exogenous and endogenous everything you can imagine <laughs> you just enjoy it well as that's the art of of working with grasping as opposed to fight flight right where you work with something enjoyable but you enjoy it rather than get attached to it mm -hmm. um when when i when i hear this the, the one question that comes up in my mind is how how big is the advantage of taking very clear practices you do in the container so in yoga you do certain poses 
and yeah. taking those exact practices as the centering practices in your life. How, how big has, has that? Well, have, have you tried that? Well, let's look at our criteria for centering. It has to be quick and it has to be invisible. Because mm -hmm. if it's not quick and if it's not invisible, you can't do it in life. Because if I start going, oh, I just need to do some alternative nostril breathing and saying, um, well, people are going to look at you funny. And you mm -hmm. can close your eyes and do your alternative. You know, try doing that when you're driving, you're going to have a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. but if, you're, if your technique is just relax and soften the belly, it's not a problem. Which you can integrate into your yoga practice. Yeah, yeah. You can I would I, I do Krav Maga training and I'm constantly integrating centering into that while my teacher's trying to kick me in the head right so it's like you but I need simple things he never taught me centering I brought that to the practice mm -hmm. and with you as a as a coach because I imagine you've worked with one or two people in your life um what's what's been your kind of takeaway of what helps coaches take their learning, their experiences, their insights from sessions into their life? What's the, what's the thing you've observed with helping with that? Well, there's a couple of things. One, that it's a powerful enough state experience that it stays with them. That's one method. <laughs> And that's why sometimes, you know, doing DMT or something can be very helpful because you don't forget it, do you? You're like, I spoke to the lizard people. Yeah. Um, so state experiences that are strong is one. Another one is really boring. It's just practice. So my students joke that I only have one answer to all their questions. Well, actually two answers. One, if they ask a bad question, the answer is it depends because they haven't been context specific enough. And if they ask a good question, the answer is practice. Um, so as an embodiment person, we're not so big on these strong state experiences. We're bigger on practice because it's safer and it integrates well. Um, the other one is just remembering. So this is a very boring answer that um, setting up reminders. Yeah. And they, they can be ritualized. They can be community based. They could be uh, an alarm that goes off. It could be, you know, there's various ways to do it. But um, people just forget stuff. It's a really boring answer, but it's, it's true. So I mean, there's probably more, but there's three that come to mind. They make a lot of sense uh, also with my own experience. I also really like your, your It Depends. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm leading a bodywork training in Germany, and our answer is basically always It Depends because it depends on what's happening in that situation and yeah. what the person wants. I mean, the problem with Buddhist is everything's contextual because everything's empty and relational, which is true, but it's also really annoying and unhelpful. So it's so the question is sort of like, is it good enough? Like, for example, should you murder children? The answer is generally no. OK, but baby Hitler drop kick him into a river. Right. So it's like, you see what I mean? So it's like, so the answer isn't it depends to should you murder children? The answer is no, because it's a good enough question. But because mm -hmm. it's always contextual, the question is always only ever good enough. It's never. Mm -hmm. So the sort of postmodern trap is always to say it depends, which is annoying and unhelpful. So the answer, so when someone says that to you, the next thing is on what? Because then we can get to another level of teaching. So for example, should you do meta meditation? Well, it depends, that's true. Okay, but on what, <laughs> right? Are you a person who tends to be overly clingy and attached anyway? Maybe don't do it. Are you the kind of person who tends to be fearful or aggressive? Definitely do it. So now we've got a good enough distinction. Yeah depends on what which in my coaching understanding would usually be what's happening in the moment and where do we want to go and then the answer is what should we do and lots of things will come from those two questions what's happening where do we want to go nice what do you think embeds change i'd love to get your, your, your on it as well. i i mean i personally agree with um the practice a lot i agree with the remembering um the state change for me personally st the state stays with you is usually um not true no, no I, I find that it that that one is really profound but it depends on is it a state change in which ba i basically feel something drop off of me so okay. something that's usually there is not there right now yeah. or if I'm actually making a profound experience of there's something present, which is usually not present, which I would call a kind of a self or an essential experience where there's self or essence present in a way that I can clearly perceive 
that's usually not there. And I find that those experiences last a lot longer because they don't just tell me, oh, I could feel differently, yeah. but they basically tell me you are different than what you thought you are. It's an identity shift rather than just stay. Uh, a couple of things on that, actually, I have to think about what you just said. That's lovely. Thank you. A um, couple more things. One that's always underestimated is community. But the people yeah. asking me what's the right practice, they never ask me who are the right people to practice with. Because I, if someone said to me, I want to change, you know, become more meditative, whatever, I, I'd say, well, find the right community. And I don't really care what you practice. You know, practice doing the washing up. And I want, well, so it's people overemphasize in our sort of individualistic culture, the technique rather than how the technique's done, which is more important than the technique and where and who the technique is done with. Like that contextual element, because immersion, change, like I changed my level of expressiveness, not through practicing improv, but, but, but just by being in Brazil for six months, but just being immersed, <laughs> right? Like a kid will learn discipline in an Aikido class just by being in an Aikido class, being immersed in that environment rather than having to teach them centering, which is an additional thing. So yeah, that occurs to me, the, the community aspect is, um, there's one more, but I forgot it, that's pretty key. <laughs> I, I would say that probably one thing I would add in addition is the mindset. Mm. Are you coming from a growth mindset? Are you coming from a fixed mindset? What's your expectancy on what it takes to change? All of these things massively play into it. That, that is a body as well, remember, right? There's no such thing as a mindset without a body set. So yes. yeah. like if you loosen someone's, but like, you know, like I think of some of my Russian colleagues, they're pretty like hard to get through to sometimes. Then we go to the banya. And they have a shot of vodka and they relax in the steam room and then all of a sudden their mind's open to any kind of possibility you know it's like it's also the woolen hat those hats are crazy man I never but you can't <laughs> convince them it's a bad idea they're really crazy. <laughs> but I, I i actually find it's awesome and it actually helps my head when i wear, wear something like that so I got it there's one in london now so there's a traditional russian bathhouse in london now so yeah, so, yeah. okay we need to wrap up lucas this is yes been- Really, really interesting stuff. And um, yeah, I hope I've given some value there in terms of what, what might be useful for people. Absolutely. Um, if it's not useful for anybody else, it definitely was for me. I'm having a lot of things to now think That's about. Before, man, they're about getting free lessons from people that would otherwise charge you lots of money. That's what podcasting is all about. That's why. I that is exactly why I wanted to talk to you. I don't actually care about you. It's just I want that insight. The audience are a bonus, right? The audience- <laughs> It's fun. I like I like chatting with you, man, and uh, I'm sure you've you've got some other good input on this. Uh, any final things before we wrap this up? It's lunchtime. Um, no, nothing for now. I just really want to say thank you very much, and I hope you have a tasty lunch. Thank you, Shan. In terms, can I say where people can find my stuff if they want to? Absolutely. I will also write it underneath the video, but share all your yeah. Thanks. Basically, just Google embodiment and stuff comes up. So Amazon, we've got books, just put embodiment in. YouTube, podcast, put embodiment in. YouTube, iTunes, uh, the internet. If you meet God, if you die and meet God, just say embodiment. He'll be like, oh, you're Mark's friend, cool. So um, yeah, any, anywhere you put embodiment in, stuff will come up. We've got stuff for yogis, for coaches, for normal people, blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's all there. Loads of free stuff on the internet, particularly iTunes and, and YouTube if you want free stuff. Yep. I'll uh, also have a link underneath the video that goes to your official, one of your official websites, because I think you also have many of those. We've got a new one coming out, actually. So okay. <laughs> for your time, ma'am. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much to you. I'm going to head off. Bye-bye. You never know what's around the next one.